take questions. This is your opportunity to ask Alan questions. We don't want you spending a lot of time speechifying because you have a lot of that in your schedule. But this is your chance to ask Alan whatever you like. We have a couple of microphones, and uh, hopefully we'll get some great answers. So thanks for being here. Okay. How are you? Did you did you love the reveal? Yes. Oh, yeah. Which uh, were your favorite vehicles? F one fifty. F one fifty Mustang. Oh, solar! Is that cool? It's so cool. Uh, you know, just maybe a couple of words to start with. Uh, what you really saw today? First of all, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're uh, you're interested in Ford because uh, seven years ago we started out on a journey um, and we made some really big decisions that you know well now. And one was that we we're going to serve all the markets around the world. And when you look at the markets worldwide, about a third of the vehicles sold will be in the Americas, North and South America. About a third will be in Europe and Africa and, uh, and Russia. And about a third and growing the fastest will be uh, Asia Pacific, especially led by China. And then if you look at the size of the vehicles, about 60% of the vehicles will be smaller size worldwide, like uh, Fiestas and Focuses. And then about 25% uh, will be medium size, like the Fusion size. And then about 15% will be the larger vehicles. And so what you saw today is the results of eight years of investing in the product line and also the production facilities around the world. Because all those vehicles were going back and forth when Mark was talking, it's like he was given a uh, speech in the freeway. Uh, that all, what you saw was all the way from the Fiesta all the way up through the F-Series. That is probably the most complete family of vehicles of anybody in the world now. And now, because of our scale and the fact that we're doing them all together, we can bring all those vehicles to all the markets around the world like, uh, like never before. So it's, it was really fun for you to see it today. Of course, it ended on a, on a really neat note with the F1, F-150. And I know you know this, but the F-150 has been the number one vehicle uh, in the United States for 32 years of all vehicles, cars or trucks has been the number one truck in the United States for uh, 37 years. And also on the, on the truck that's smaller than that, you saw the Ranger, which is the number one pickup around the world uh, in the smaller size. So it was fun for you to get a chance to see the response has been uh, fantastic. And, and with that, uh, I'd be glad to ask any question that you want to ask. Maybe just raise your hand and introduce yourself and kind of what you're doing or so I know a little bit about you. Yes, we'll, get, we'll have some microphones and just raise your hand. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Chad Gershner from AutoGeeks.com. Very good. Um, congratulations, first off, on both the F-150 launch today and the Mustang back in December. I think they're both ex exceptional products, and I think they're, Thank they're you. both, they both do very well. Um, now that we are sort of on the precipice of the biggest year Ford maybe has had, I mean, the Mustang's going global, obviously the F-150 is going to be a strong seller. Um, you personally, what in the past six or seven years has been your number one achievement, what you, what you made your most proud of? Wow. Uh, I feel like I'm at my retirement party. <laughs> uh, well, gee, it makes me think of how I got here uh, because I had the honor to serve at, at Boeing for, for 37 years and I was on the, uh, I had the honor to be on the design team for every Boeing airplane, the 707, 727, 737. 47567, 777, and the launch of the 787. And if you look at the world today, uh, nearly 80% of all the seats that are flying in the world are on Boeing airplanes. So I never thought I'd leave Boeing, and I got a call from Bill Ford. And Bill was just compelling. He, he told me uh, what the situation was at Ford and, and how Henry Ford was committing to, committed to open the highways to all mankind around the world with with the safe and efficient cars and trucks and, and affordable so everybody could participate. And he also shared that Ford uh, had some real issues and the economy was slowing down, the fuel prices were going up, and he asked me if I would join. And uh, it was, it was, you know, I was being asked to serve a second global and American icon. And I think the things that are just so satisfying are really what we saw today. Uh, we pulled together seven years ago around the strategy I just described, to serve all the markets with a complete family of vehicles. We made a commitment in quality, and fuel efficiency, and safety, and smart, and also make them affordable with our, with our scale. And what you saw today is the results of seven years of doing that. We, 
We borrowed twenty-three and a half billion dollars to the bank because we believed in this plan. We paid back that loan completely. Uh, we reinstated the dividend. We are funding all of our pensions, and we are profitably growing. Last year, we had one of the most uh, successful years in Ford's history, 113-year history. Uh, 2014 is going to be very, very strong also, and we're continuing to invest in the future, both on the product and on the production. But you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe the biggest thing is the, the, the talent that we have on the extended enterprise around the world, and the fact that they're all working together. We operate as one team. Every week we get together from Asia Pacific to Europe to the United States to South America, and we go over the plan, and we pull together to deliver all these great products and services. And I think uh, that culture and that working together and those talented people are going to be what absolutely sustains uh, Ford going forward. And you're meeting a lot of them here. You're meeting a lot of the Ford uh, people, which is great. So those are kind of some of the highlights. I, I really feel good about it. Make sense? Yes. We'll get you a microphone. Hi, Alan. I'm Casey Palmer from Toronto. I just do my independent blog, CaseyPalmer.com. And um, in Toronto, we have a really strong public transit system, so we don't grow up with cars as much as in many places across the U.S., for example. So even with myself, I only got my first car this past year because I was having a kid, and now we're like, you know, it's good to have one, and it's awesome, but how do you think it works to bridge the gap with, I guess, a generation that may not have grown up with cars and may not have had the automobile as a huge part of their upbringing. Sure. I think, I think this is really an important uh, uh, question. And it really, we've kind of taken a point of view that around the world, that uh, the majority of people are going to start to live in the bigger cities. And as you know, like Chongqing, where we operate, we have a fantastic operation. It's a small city of 35 million people. And we just keep forgetting that these cities are going are to be the, kind of the uh, choice for the living style. And, and you just can't keep putting cars into a big city and making it work. So I'm, I'm with you completely that we work with all the governments around the world and all the big cities. How can we help them have uh, personal mobility? We have every kind of, uh, you know, it's like the octopus system in Hong Kong, where you have ways of moving around, and, no matter what the transportation system is, there's always going to be a great need for cars. And there can be all kinds of ways of delivering that. You might not own it, you might share it, you might use it on the weekend or whatever. But I think the most important thing that the world does, the governments, and it needs to be led by the governments, right? That they do is we start to invest in making these cities absolutely, not just little, but fun and exciting to be. And we'll always, and we'll love to be part of that solution, and we could maybe morph our business into different things associated with transportation because we're a transportation company. And we'll always make that cars and trucks that people really do want. But I think that's the most important thing. The models will change. You're seeing it too. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. And I think all the cities are starting to figure it out. In China, for example, where they're, where they're really building out their cities, they're really taking that into account with subways, uh, with like, carpooling, with all kinds of rapid transit. Because that's the only way to make that really neat in the big cities. We have a microphone over here too, you think? Maybe I can see. Our hand? We have a hand way in the back. Are bloggers usually this reserved? <laughs> I thought you were like the leading edge of discussion. Hi, Alan. Uh, Mike with Mike's Roadtrip.com here. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the driverless car. How far out in the future do you think that will it'll take to get to the market? Uh, I think it'll be a while uh, because the technology is just evolving. It'll also have to do with the economics. Uh, a lot of the things that you see today, uh, those sensor sets are going to three, four hundred thousand dollars a vehicle, and I think the automobile industry is always going to be driven uh, by economics. But kind of gets back to the other question. You can imagine all kinds of rapid transit systems that can move a lot more people uh, and be automated even faster, which would have a lot of value near term, right? So see the bigger cities, uh, like the BART system in San Francisco. And so I think in our case, we're like on the leading edge of enabling technology. And the neat thing is that uh, we're incorporating that technology now incrementally. So you think of all of our yaw control, mobile stability control, uh, all the things that we put in the car, the, the personal awareness of where you are, like the new Emily series is going to have a camera that goes 360 degrees around. So I mean, for what they do, it's going to be fantastic. 
So I think the enabling technology will continue to lead on that and then we'll, we'll implement it incrementally. But again, I think the governments and the regulators, we got a lot of work to do about getting to a place where you have ultimately uh, uh, autonomous cars. Remember, air, airplanes have two pilots. And there's a reason why. Because it's very hard to anticipate all the things that an airplane can be confronted with. And I would say the same thing with cars today, because a lot of things you, you run into you can't anticipate. The sensor system can come out. So I think it's great for the industry because of all the near-term benefits, but it's going to be a, take a lot of working together to get to the place where you where you uh, just ride along in a car. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who would like to do that so you can you know access the internet, do things like that. <laughs> Make sense? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Julia Piper from Washington, D.C., Environment, Energy, Publishing, Climate Wire. Um, can you talk about how Ford's incorporating uh, fuel economy into not just its plug-ins and hybrid, but across its offerings, even into the Mustang? I think you've got maybe the EcoBoost involved. So even maybe touch more on the heavier duty and the sports cars and how you're incorporating fuel economy there. Oh, sure. Uh, well, you, you see the, you know, the brand promise around the room. Is this a great room or not? Well, this is the first event I think we've had in this room in Detroit. It's like, it's like phenomenal. But you see the green, the smart, and the quality and the safe. And seven years ago, we decided, we took a point of view that these four characteristics would be really, really important to the automobile uh, consumers. Because if, you take, if you're going to deliver on a brand promise, you need to take a point of view about what's important for the customer. And it's turned out that this has really stood the test of time. This is what people want. And they'll pay for it, and they value it. And when it comes to the green pillar, it's just amazing, to your point, that whether you're driving a Fiesta or whether you're driving an F-350, the consumer wants the very best fuel efficiency, no matter what the size of it, because it's such an important part uh, of the cost, plus they care about the environment, they care about making a difference. And uh, so here's our technology strategy, and, and you pretty much laid it out. The most important thing that we can do with our scale to make a difference is to continuously improve the internal combustion engine. Most important thing. Uh, internal combustion engine is going to be around a long time. The big pools of oil have been found. It's harder to find oil and bring it to the market now, but it's such an efficient medium that they're going to be around for a while. So the number one thing we can do is every year improve the internal combustion engine. Um, that's why you see things like direct fuel injection and turbocharging and lightweight materials. Everything that we do is improving the fuel mileage uh, every year. And you saw that probably the biggest improvement in fuel mileage will come with that new F-150 today with aluminum. Aluminum is such a great material, and pound, uh, pound uh, per pound, it is stronger than steel. Up in, in the past, it has cost more than steel, which is why steel was uh, predominant. But now with the fuel savings we can get with the new aluminum alloys, uh, we can make, we can, we're gonna take over 700 pounds of weight out of the vehicle. That means we can downsize the engines, make smaller engines, fuel efficiency improvement, lower CO2. So again, number one thing, improved internal combustion engine, both petrol and diesel. And I think we'll see continuous more alternative fuels, and each one has an economic story too, like ethanol or, or biomass fuels. I think we'll see more hydrogen going forward as the infrastructure builds out. Hydrogen is, is good, but it works better on the larger vehicles because of the tanks. And you also have to have, to have the infrastructure for hydrogen. I think we'll see uh, beyond that uh, more lightweight materials like you're seeing with aluminum. We'll see more composites. Uh, we'll see integrated uh, aerodynamic systems that are integrated where the vehicles get smaller, the powertrains get smaller. Then I think we'll see uh, more electrification. And electrification is really very interesting um, because uh, it's the batteries are good, but they need the cost needs to come down. We need to be able to charge them in hot and cold temperature. We need to keep the residual value up. So, but the new chemistries like lithium ion look pretty good. I think we're going to see some more chemistries past the electrical vehicles. But also, we need the infrastructure to build out, right? Because you've got to be able to charge your vehicles. And for all of us that care, we need to generate the electricity, right? Because we're not going to solve the problem by just using electricity, but we need to generate it clean. So I think that's going to be another public-private partnership to figure out how to how do we accelerate that. And um, beyond that, I think we'll see hydrogen. But again, we need the infrastructure. And also, we need really good batteries. And we need really efficient, cost-effective fuel cells. 
because you can imagine a, a world where you mix the platinum with the hydrogen and electricity goes over to the battery and the water comes out the tailpipe. Now that's great, but we still need to generate the electricity plant. So uh, I think that's the technology roadmap. In Ford's case, when you walk into a Ford showroom and you're seeing a lot of vehicles here, whatever works for you, you're gonna be able to get it for it. So you can get petrol, diesel, hydrogen, um, not hydrogen yet, but you can get um, a natural gas, uh, you can get a hybrid vehicle that has an internal combustion engine and elect uh, an electric drive. You can get a plug-in hybrid, we have a bigger battery, we can plug it in if that works for you. Or you can get an all-electric vehicle with even a bigger battery and no internal combustion engine. And you can get it all from Ford. Now in our case, we'll make those vehicles on the same line, we'll use a lot of the same parts so we can make them really affordable so that you get the most affordable vehicle. But the real choice is, our, our kind of our brand promise is the power of choice, where you get to choose what works for you and your lifestyle. Make sense? Great question. Yes. Yes. Whoever has the microphone is in charge. Okay. Hi, Frank Persona from the Seattle area. First of all, we miss you back up in the sound. Thank you. So, um, with some of the recent announcements with the uh, technology industry, specifically around mobile devices and some of the partnerships that have been being formed with GM and you know Android or Google rather and Apple. Yep. Kind of curious as to what Ford's vision for the future is with respect to mobile devices, particularly around Android and iOS, and how that's going to integrate with our vehicles in the future. Absolutely. Do you remember, uh, were you at the Consumer Electronics Show when we were invited to be the, the keynote address? This was incredible. How many years ago was that, Ray? Four years? Four years ago, we were invited to, Ford was invited to address the Consumer Electronics Show. This is a Consumer Electronics Show and an automobile company was invited to address it. And so I called all my friends in, in Seattle and said, I'm really sorry, but I wasn't going to ask you the keynote address. Uh, still love you. Um, and we uh, presented uh, our electrification, we presented sync, remember that? And you know, hands on the wheel, uh, eyes on the road. We had maybe 100 voice commands at the time and nobody thought voice would take off. And we laid all that out. And then we even had some electric vehicles and we showed them the apps that you could you could uh, talk to your car outside the car and be all brought in with your smartphone, not embedded and complicated. And you can't move in the industry. And the response was unbelievable, unbelievable. And I remember, I remember one of the headlines in one of the major newspapers after we did that, and it said, Ford, the mobile app of choice. Get it? Like Ford, the brand. Like if you want to have a mobile app that works for you where you can drive a car and stay connected to the world, then Ford's the brand for you. So we still believe in that strategy. We really believe that most of it will be brought in. We think that the cars will end up uh, being hot spots also. So we'll have the pipes. But we're gonna be, the most important thing we do is to make sure that it's a safe driving experience. So your hand, we really believe your hands ought to be on the wheel, your eyes ought to be on the road. Everything ought to be done with your voice. That's why our announcements on that app link are so important because we want to keep building on the smart devices. We are agnostic on the different devices because the consumers are going to decide which devices work for them. And they'll change in size and, and uh, capability. But we really think that when you get into a Ford, you ought to have a very clear, uh, very safe experience innovation with the car. And we want to keep the, the innovation on the electronics going at the speed of electronics while we maintain the configuration and the integrity of the car itself. Make sense? Yes, you've been very patient. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, Wendy Silva from Toronto. I'm a blogger at mapscroll.ca. My question is, with the reintroduction of the mid-size GM truck, is the Global Ranger going to come back to North America? Well, let's just get right down to it now. <laughs> uh, nothing new to announce about that today, but a couple of comments about your question. The Ranger is the number one smaller truck around the world, and it's fantastic. People absolutely love it. In the United States, the United States has preferred the F Series. And you can imagine the price point start to get closer because we have the F Series offered at a wide range of prices so people can get the vehicle they want, equipped like they want. So, in general, they want an F Series for their money. That's the best value for them. Now, and also having said that, the market for the smaller size pickup continues to get smaller and smaller because originally it was kind of used as a commuter. It was, it was lighter weight, it was still efficient, but it really wasn't used a lot as a truck. Well now, 
at Ford, you can get all these great utilities vehicles now that, that satisfy that need. They're all very fuel efficient. So right now, the Ranger is our number one vehicle outside the United States, and that's and the F-Series is the number one vehicle in the United States. Make sense? Yep. Yes. So the neat thing is that for, the, for a, a portion of your journey every day, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles, whatever, you're all on all electricity. And for most people, they'd be on electricity all the time, right? But you also have an internal combustion engine and a smaller gas tank where you don't have any range, range anxiety. You can go anywhere you want to go. And to your point about uh, uh, solar panels, it would be the very same thing. It's not going to work everywhere all the time. So I think that the choice of the technology is going to be combinations of them. They're going to be hybrids of different ones of them. And it's great because with our power of choice, if you can pick a vehicle that works for your area, you live in, your, your, the way you live, your lifestyle, your available electricity. But I think that all of those medium are going to be part of the power of vehicles going forward. Okay, they said just one more. They said you're really busy on a tight schedule. Yes. Hi, I'm Phil Covington, Triple Pundit, based in uh, California, um, writing about sustainable business. Just another question on the powertrain. In Europe, diesels are very popular. Um, a lot of times you hear that Americans don't use diesels, but there are other manufacturers bringing more and more in. Um, in terms of passenger vehicles, do you see Ford bringing in diesels as well as hybrids? I think over. Uh, can everybody hear the question? Can you hear about the diesels? Diesels, the new diesels are fantastic, to your point. And as you know, we're a leader in diesels uh, in Europe and many other countries around the world. In the United States, we still have some work to do on the regulatory side because the United States had a really bad uh, experience with the, uh, the dirtier diesels earlier on. And so just the regulations that go with diesels today can add six to $10,000 per car in the United States. So. The most important thing we work on is working with the regulators to, to make sure that everybody understands what the possibilities are today. And I think as we uh, come to a shared view on that, you'll see more diesels in the United States. But the diesels have come a long way. But again, it gets back to, uh, that's the reason I just love the Ford plan. It's not one or the other, because it also depends on the pricing. And, and every country around the world is dealing with their energy differently, whether it's electricity, whether it's diesel, whether it's uh, petrol. So the most important thing we do is, to your point, is to have the options. And we do that around the world, a place where it will start to increase, I think, with harmonization will be a nice thing. They are great. Okay, how about a hand for our president and CEO, Alan Mulally. Thank you, Alan. Uh, one last thing. Thanks a lot for joining us. I mean, this might be, a, every year it gets bigger and bigger, and I just love it, the fact that you're attending, and you care about it, and the things that we care about, it's really fun for you to share all your stories. So thank you. Okay? Thank you each of you. Thanks. Just a reminder, uh, coming up here at noon, Raj Nair, our group vice president for product development, is going to be doing a roundtable.